I'm very pleased to welcome Caitlin Johnson of AmFam Ventures, and we're going to be talking InsureTech. Good awesome. morning to you. Good morning, Nick. How are you? I'm great. It's awesome, awesome. To, ha awesome to have you here. We're going to jump right in and do like rapid fire awesome. drill session on InsureTech. And so the first question I wanted to ask you was, uh, do you think, uh, given what you've seen, um, I've been hearing the words, I may have coined it, InsureTech 2.0. Okay. Do you think we're transitioning into a new uh, direction, a new paradigm when it comes to InsureTech? I absolutely do. I think, you know, we've watched the first wave of InsureTech, so the V1, so to speak, kind of go through and they were um, valued on their hyper growth. And uh they left a lot wanting in the insurance fundamentals category. And so I think investors have now gotten wise to that. And what that has done is predominantly made sure that anybody else who's going to be raising large amounts of money from here on moving forward is going to be valued, I think, on, on two fundamentals, which is insurance fundamentals, as well as growth and, and attractive growth yeah. rates. So I, I definitely feel that we've seen a shift. Yeah. And, and I've, um, I've also been, I've surprised in the past like six months, um, maybe even the past year, um, how many um, tech related companies that are in insure tech have been kind of raising their hands and saying, hey, that MGA thing, that might be a good element of our business model. Like, Eat totally. our own cooking type of thing. Totally. Um, it, it, what What are your feelings about that? Because I think that might dovetail into what you're describing, where they they it's beyond just hyper growth now. It's about mm -hmm. the fundamentals. Like, can you create a moat? Do you have something special? Um, how do you think the MGA play with tech companies kind of fits into that? You know, um, we'll see how it shakes out. I have a sneaky suspicion and we, we for a long time have bought into this in what we've called insurance everywhere thesis or incidental distribution. I think Andreessen Horowitz recently penned something that um, called it embedded insurance and now it's all a buzz. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was fundamentally the underpinning of our investment in clear cover back in, in 2016. And so we've long been believers that we're going to start seeing insurance pop up at different places. It just makes sense at the point of sale when the customer is thinking about a product um, that they would also think about purchasing insurance. And so I think that's where you're starting to see a lot of these tech companies saying, oh, I can get a cut of commissions for doing either um, a consultative sale or having an MGA um, where I can even gobble up more of that. Um, so, but, I, but you know what? Building an MGA is tough. It's regulated. Um, I, I just end up thinking a lot of folks will end up pushing the easy button, um, at least in the beginning to get off the ground to see if they can even partner with somebody who can bring to bear an interesting insurance solution for them um, and what the, the attach rates will be. And so until they have a clear and firm understanding about what they're standing to gain, um, my sense is they'll look for technology to kind of help enable that um, embedded insurance or that incidental distribution play versus trying to go it themselves. Um, and, and the other piece that I think is, is really interesting is that, um, you know, in some cases, it makes sense to just offer the customer a singular insurance um, policy. So like our investment in a company called Protect is exactly that. They're um, insurance for live events. Um, and at the time you purchase your ticket, you can also choose to purchase this um, event insurance and for any reason. Sorry. I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. And so it makes sense not to offer a choice there because you can, you can, it, you know, it's an attractive product um, and it's in the best interest of whomever is selling the ticket to try to bind, um, you know, an insurance policy alongside of that. And it, uh, it just adds more confusion when you give customers choice. You want to make that, that checkout process very streamlined and simple. But there's other instances when having a limited choice platform makes a ton of sense. Um, and so like 
for especially on lines that people are used to shopping. Um, so I, I think, you know, if a lot of tech companies want to go the MGA route, I believe it's a little bit challenged because it's almost, a, you have to be a singular you know, you're that carrier, right? You're, you're providing a single option functionally to the consumer. And I think there are a lot of instances when it's, it's good to have a little bit of competition on a platform. Yeah, I, I think um, kind of to tag along to the element that you just brought up, I think part of InsureTech 2.0 might be this like abstraction element, like with Protect, right? Yeah. Where it's, um, hey, it's a, it's a single step insurance buy, like so super easy. You plug in and it, it, it almost creates a defensible position for them because part of, you know, the decision-making of the company that might be adding the insurance is the ease of use yes. element. But then it's like no one, you know, protect other than like a B2B, there's like the the business world won't even be thinking about protect this it could be uh uh enabled and embedded in all of these different things and no one will think twice about it but that's kind of like i think the advantage right exactly. simple easy to use no drama like it, and you um it fits it fits the the b2b thing i think that might be an element of InsureTech 2.0, I interviewed uh, the co-CEOs of Loop Insurance. Yeah. And what struck me was, at first I was thinking, oh, this is a telematics play. Like we've seen that play. And yeah. then after the conversation, like this is completely different. What they're using insurance as a monetization vehicle. Yeah. But what they're going after is delivering a set of solutions to the driver. So for instance, while the phone is keeping track of the driving, it's like, hey, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. You might be hungry. There's this pizza place and we've seen you shop at this other area. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's like a, you know, a companion tool that's very different. And that's my sense of InsureTech 2.0 is maybe this abstraction of not thinking of it as insurance it's it's you know being there when you're having a life event or something like that uh that to me that's very exciting because it's it is it's it's not just 1.0 to 2.0 it's a big leap yeah totally you know? I, it, it totally is i totally agree with that you know um part of the element that you talked about where investors are going to probably be looking at uh, insurance fundamentals. Mm -hmm. And part of your answer for the MGA was like, well, how are they going to do that? And what's the shape of that? How important is it for these companies to have insurance expertise mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in house to actually be able to get those insurance fundamentals? How do you, how do you advise your companies around that? You know, it is funny because we've often um, thought about do you have to have insurance expertise to start a, an insurance company? And I mean, if you look at like the first wave, a lot of those folks were not people from the insurance sector. Um, but I think increasingly um, so that that's very important, um, especially in embedding the fundamentals at such, you know, at, at, at the origination of the institution. And so, um, you know, whether it's the CEO who is kind of cut, cut their teeth in insurance before, um, or they're hiring in and one of the co-founders is uh, that insurance expertise, I do think it is really important it, it, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, it's, it's how you build your whole company, everything down from the tech stack to the work you do with the regulators, to the deals you cut, um, either for data, how you ink your um, your papers, so both reinsurance um, and fronting. Um, and so I think that all of that is is very important and the speed at which you do it. So people who you know have been around the block before, I think have this credibility and also have the relationships that it takes to get off the ground uh, in, a, in a much faster manner. And MGEs are not, um, a super capital efficient uh, startup business. I mean, it takes 
it, it takes a heavy, it's not as bad as hardware, certainly not as bad as hardware, but it is, it is, um, you know, definitely takes more cash than your average SaaS company to kind of get off the, to the races. And so from that standpoint, I also think it's really important if you have somebody who knows what they're doing, they can just attack the market with speed. Um, so I look at, um, you know, yourself and I, and I look at, um, Steve Lakis from Branch, who in our portfolio, who came out of Allstate, um, came out of Verarisk, and has really been able to accomplish so much um, on such a smaller timeline and time frame than any of the other insure techs that we've seen before. And that's been really impressive to watch. Yeah, I think uh, MGA startup costs, um, even if you're like thinking of it from a seed stage, um, I've seen too many people undercut it. It's seven figures. Yeah. There's no way around it. Like it just, it takes that much time and effort. And I think the, um, I think a, what a lot of the tech company, in my advising of these, what I think is missing from tech companies that want to do the MGA thing is that um, if you don't have that credibility, you're essentially lighting capital on fire because it could take two years for you to get capacity. And I don't, and I think that's like the, the element that investors need to kind of focus on is speed. What you just said, speed to market, that's going to be the yeah. most, the most critical thing. And then everything else I think sort of falls in. Um, and the, you brought up Steve Lekas. You also brought up Kit Clearcover. So I have a couple of questions before we yeah. end this, but um, I think one, having interviewed Steve, yeah. One of the huge advantages is that um, insurance, back to insurance fundamentals. Yeah. Steve understands the, um, the interplay of capital, mm -hmm. not only investor capital, but capacity. Yes. Right. And the capital on the, but whether it's from an insurance side or reinsurance side. And I think that was also missing in insure tech. 1.0 is you heard a lot about like capital light structures yes. and stuff like that. And I think ultimately your, what I think a lot of the investment community missed with InsureTech 1.0 and these capital light structures was you wanted hyper growth, but you can't get hyper growth if you don't have a balance sheet to place all of this stuff. And that becomes the critical limiting factor um, I expect that we're going to see more of that is, you know, how are you, how are you dealing with surplus? Do you have a, do you have a plan for surplus? How are you, how are you um, managing reinsurance around that too? Those seem like two critical and uh, important things. How do you think about that? Um, so it, it's a tricky question. I feel like reinsurance is really important to get in bed with the right partner and making sure that you have that capacity. I also think it puts a real emphasis on um, your underwriting and like, are you properly segmenting? Um, because if you're not properly segmenting, your reinsurance partnership is not going to last very long because they're going to quickly realize that you don't know what you're doing from an underwriting standpoint. So um, I do think it is a you know, a, a word to the wise and kind of a note of caution that like, you just can't come in guns a blazing and think it's so easy to, to do insurance. I think there's, you know, a real art to underwriting, um, and doing segmentation properly. I mean, it's why progressive is progressive on the auto side and why they do so well. Um, and having that, that is the secret sauce. And, you know, it's funny because the regulators make you disclose it, but everybody's gotten really creative with how they've been able to kind of obfuscate really what's at the heart of their decisioning. Um, and, um, and so again, this kind of goes back to having somebody savvy enough to be able to read through all of the filings, understand the people who are the gold standards in the market. What are they doing from an underwriting standpoint? How could you replicate that um, within your own MGA or carrier structure? Um, because it does behoove you to learn from the folks who've gone before and, and especially in such a frothy and competitive market. Um, because reinsurance capacity is hard to come by and you don't want to mess it up once you got it. Yep. And it could be getting really expensive soon too. Exactly. Yeah. 
Um, you brought up clear cover before. So yeah. clear cover, I believe was purchased or had a major investment by mm -hmm. American family, which you're related to. Um, I, I, I think, you know, we had a frothy market with IPOs. Mm -hmm. um, do you, when you work with your uh, investment companies, yeah. How do you talk about exit plans? And I, I, cause I think there's probably a different, a little bit of a different strategy with, Hey, you know, an insurance company could end up buying us out or, mm -hmm. Hey, we should shoot for an IPO. How do you talk to them about those kinds of exits? Yeah. So clear cover, um, actually didn't exit, but they had a a very big round recently, which was raised by Eldridge, um, or led by Eldridge. Um, we, from our ventures fund, Ampan Ventures participated in it from a parada standpoint, because uh, we incubated clear cover and have just been tremendous supporters of them through their life cycle and are really excited about their future. Um, so, but we did have, a, you might've been thinking of Bull Penguin, which did exit okay, recently. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and, and one of our LPs, American Family Insurance, uh, did purchase that. And so, um, yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question. It's definitely been an evolving conversation and evolving narrative that we've had at the fund over the past, um, I don't know, it, gosh, a year, year and two months now, um, really ever since COVID hit, we started to take stock, which it was, it was funny because I think COVID hit at the same time that Lemonade and, and, and then Root very shortly thereafter went public. Right. So it was all of these events kind of coinciding at, at one time. Um, so that's what always reminds me of is, oh, at the beginning of COVID, we were talking about this a lot. Um, but yeah, so I think, um, I guess here's where I'm at. I, I think the good companies um, that do have good growth um, will be able to exit. Um, I think that the way we think about exits is you either need to be ha have built yourself to be standalone um, so that you can continue to operate in a cost-efficient cost manner um, while utilizing the resources of a, you know, of a public equity raise via an IPO. Um, and, and companies that look like that will be able to, to go that route. Um, and I think you, you're, you are going to need to have to be able to show some insurance fundamentals um, here in this next wave to be able to, to take that exit ramp. I think the other way is if you build a tech stack or book um, that would complement um, one of the carriers today that they might look to snap you up, but I do believe there's a cap on what they're willing to pay um, because I think the narrative at the carriers is always, well, could we build this ourselves and what value do we really see as this book? So unless it's that kind of perfect storm where it's the right point of time, you have the right customer demographic and they're really looking to lean hard into what you've done, I think it starts to get hard to get over a billion dollar exits through acquisition. And so therefore you are looking at um, kind of the, the public market as, as a path for exit. Um, but we still think we're in like the first inning here of insure tech and, um, there's going to be a bright and brilliant future. And we're going to see lots of exits, lots of success kind of come out of this asset class. Excellent insights. So two quick questions, yeah. one word answers, um, to respect your time. Um, are you still a soccer referee? I am. Yeah. But uh, I do that much less frequently. <laughs> okay. And be best, better learning experience, Harvard, B Harvard Business School or mm -hmm. AmFam Ventures? Oh, that's a toss up. That's a toss up. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, excellent. Excellent uh, interview, Caitlin. Thank you so much for your insights and uh, we'll catch up. Maybe we'll catch up at ITC in Vegas. I would love that. Thanks, okay. Nick. Thank you.